speak directly into the lapel. My name is Scotty Greenwood. I'm with the Canadian American Business Council. Uh, we're delighted to have you. On behalf of my colleague, Kyle McDonald, who uh, runs the show, we are so thrilled to be here. I want to thank Google for the great hospitality. Thank Colin McKay and Lauren Skelly and all the Googlers. I want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, and let me just explain how this day is going to go. We're going to be here for approximately eight hours, so I hope you <laughs> eat a lot. Uh, I'm going to, uh, in a moment, introduce the introducer, and then uh, our honored guest will give a talk, and then our honored guest and I will um, have a little chat. We'd really like you to participate in the chat as well. Uh, so you'll see index cards uh, on your tables, and uh, if you feel so inclined, fill out a card at any point. Uh, someone will collect it, bring it up to me, and if I can read your writing, and if I think you have a clever question, uh, I'll pose it to the minister as long as we have time. Uh, we really are thrilled to do this. The, this. the Canadian American Business Council is all about dialogue between policymakers and private sector uh, business leaders and civil society. And so we appreciate the opportunity to do this. Uh, Google and CABC partnered in Ottawa some months ago and had a conversation uh, with John Baird. Went pretty well. Uh, and we're studiously bi-national, non-partisan, and uh, really enjoy these opportunities and look forward to the discussion with you. Um, before I introduce Ambassador Dewar, can I just ask all the members of the Canadian American Business Council Board of Directors, past and present, to stand so that we can say thank you for all you do? <laughs> Amgad, Toby, Wendy, Dave, Kelly, Michael, Peter, thank you. Unbelievable cross-section of the economy right there from, I, w I won't describe it, but they'll tell you at their tables. So there, Washington is really fortunate because we have uh, all the ambassadors from around the world posted here. And to get posted to Washington in the Foreign Service or a political appointee, um, you have to be fantastic at what you do. It's just um, part of the deal. And Canada has been particularly lucky. Um, there are a lot of talkers, but we have a doer. So ladies and gentlemen, Gary Dewar. <laughs> Not the doer, I'm the introducer. Uh, thank you very much, Scotty. Uh, I know you're ready to roll with your Q&As and uh, in a nonpartisan way, of course. Uh, I want to thank uh, CABC again for uh, providing a platform for policy and political debates uh, uh, here uh, today at lunch. And I'd like to thank Google uh, for hosting us at this uh, great setting. Uh, I was in my first conversation pod. Uh, today at Google. I've seen a pot of whales before in northern Manitoba. I've had lots of conversations as ambassador, but I've never been in a conversation pod. So thank you very, very much. It's, uh, and I think all of the staff from the embassy are looking at how they can modernize our cafeteria. But there's no money in the budget, so uh, <laughs> forget about it. Just forget about it. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Canada's uh, Minister of industry, the Honorable James Moore. Uh, as you know, uh, many of you know, uh, he ha has, was elected to Parliament uh, in 2000 uh, from British Columbia. And when you read his bio, the word youngest uh, and youngest and youngest keeps popping up because he has been the youngest, uh, the youngest member of Parliament from British Columbia. And when he's appointed uh, minister in 2008 by Prime Minister Harper, he was the youngest regional minister in the history of Canada, and uh, he continues to be an experienced person that is very young. And uh, I can't mention age because I'm on subject to all the human rights acts of two different uh, countries. Uh, he, it is certainly, uh, you're all very aware that uh, he was our Minister of Canadian Heritage and, and, and Culture and Official Languages. Uh, he was the first minister appointed from British Columbia in those portfolios. Uh, he. Uh, was, as I say, the regional minister from British Columbia. I know that he was a great champion in art, of arts and culture in and both official languages in Canada. And, of course, he modernized Canada's copyright law, something that some of you have raised in the past uh, here in Washington, dare I say. Uh, I know, uh, certainly speaking from personal experience, he was very effective uh, working with our prime minister on the uh, new Canadian Museum of Human Rights in Winnipeg that will open up. Uh, uh, on Friday. Uh, he was involved in the telecommunication and broadcasting 
uh, business. Uh, he was appointed uh, in 2013 based on his performance in previous portfolios as uh, Minister of Industry. Uh, and uh, of course, this is an extremely important portfolio in any uh, parliamentary government. It's very important to Canada uh, to um, be advocating on behalf of jobs and economic growth. Uh, he is involved in policies on intellectual pro policy, uh, property, investment, uh, internal trade, the digital economy. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Honourable James Moore. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Ambassador Dewar, for the very uh, overly kind and generous introduction. Whenever somebody uh, is that kind and that generous in introduction, I like to say that it shows that uh, not all forms of inflation are painful. So thank you very much for that. Uh, but I do very much appreciate it. I'm really glad to be here as well. And I should also recognize that former Ambassador Giffen is here. So thank you for uh, being at the lunch today. We had a very good discussion this morning about some Canada-US matters, as uh, I know the American public will be heading into the midterm campaign soon, but also on a number of policy issues that are of mutual interest and concern to both Canada uh, and the United States. Uh, but I did want to come here to the Business Council to talk a little bit and give a bit of an update about Canada's economy, where we're at. Uh, you may know that this week the Canadian Parliament resumed in Ottawa and we're picking up, frankly, where we left off. Uh, many of you who are Canadians know that Canada elected three minority parliaments in a row in 2004, 2006, 2008. And it wasn't until 2011 that Canadians elected a majority parliament. It was the first time that they did so since the year 2000. And they did so because Prime Minister Stephen Harper went to Canadians and asked specifically for a mandate to have a focused, steady, national federal government that would concentrate on the Canadian economy and to make sure that we were moving forward with that task. And I would also be, uh, begin to this speech by reminding all of us that the health of the relationship between Canada and the United States is essential to our economic growth both, uh, on both sides of the border. I have this uh, beginning slide here of the Peace Arch border crossing. Some of you may know I'm from the west coast of Canada and my hometown of Port Moody is just outside of the city of Vancouver. And every time I go down to Seattle, go Seahawks, um, I, I drive often through uh, the Peace Arch border crossing. And I'm reminded at this beautiful border crossing, which is a legacy of previous conflicts between Canada and the United States, of the motto that is shown at the top of the Peace Arch crossing, which reads, brethren dwelling together in unity because we do, of course, share the longest border in all of the world. And there are some numbers about the Canadian-US economic friendship and relationship that are important for us to remind ourselves of, certainly as Canadians. You know, Canada is the United States' largest customer, purchasing $233 billion in goods from the United States a year. That's more than Japan, the UK, and China combined. Canada buys more from the United States than China, Japan and the UK combined, $233 billion. But more than that, there are more than 8 million direct US jobs that depend on this relationship with Canada. But more than that, there are over 17,000 Canadian businesses that are doing business in the United States, directly employing more than 620,000 American citizens. And we exchange more than $1.4 million in commerce every minute of every day. So we are inextricably linked as trading partners and as neighbors. And our government, led by Prime Minister Stephen Harper, is focused on ensuring that this relationship stays strong, grows stronger, to the mutual benefit of Canadians and Americans alike. Through the Beyond Borders initiative, by twinning the Detroit-Windsor border crossing, by investing in key commercial infrastructure, and by working on regulatory cooperation between our countries to ensure that prosperity is realized on both sides of the border. You know, in Canada, the global recession did hit us hard. But we recovered earlier, and we emerged from the recession steady, strong, and among the top performers of all G7 countries. Because Canada is a low-tax jurisdiction, we now have in Canada, across the board, the lowest taxes that we've seen in almost 50 years. In the federal government, under Stephen Harper's leadership, we have lower taxes in almost every way that the federal government collects taxes. We've lowered the national sales tax by two points. We've lowered small business taxes. We've increased the personal deduction for even paying taxes to begin with, taking tens of thousands of low-income Canadians and seniors off the tax rolls altogether. And for the purposes of business and commerce, of course, we've also lowered corporate tax rates from 22 down to 15%. 15%. The combined 
corporate tax rate on average across the country between the federal and provincial governments is a full 13 percentage points lower than what's offered in the United States. And as a result of that, we've seen economic growth in Canada. You know, we are very competitive as a country. The tax reductions that we've put in place have had great benefits for our country. And we are very pleased as a country to see that foreign firms, including some very high profile American firms, like Burger King, like Microsoft and others, are looking north to move to Canada, to build and, uh, and expand their footprints in Canada, to create jobs in Canada, but that will see benefits all across the global economy. Because to come to Canada and do business is to take great advantage of our tax rates and great advantage of our investment environment in Canada. But it's also to take advantage of the fact that Canada is one of the great free trading nations in all the world. When Stephen Harper became Prime Minister of Canada, he was sworn in office in January of 2006, elected in 2006, I should say, sworn in shortly thereafter, that at that moment, Canada had binding free trade agreements with exactly five countries in all of the world. The United States, Mexico, Costa Rica, Israel, uh, and Chile. Today, we have free trade agreements with 43 countries around the world. And what's important to remember about that is not just that we've gone from five to 43, impressive enough, but that we've gone from five to 43 at a time when around the world, as you no doubt have noticed here, that in Europe and elsewhere, that the forces against globalization were on the march. Political parties that were often openly xenophobic, that were anti-trade, that saw the global economy as not part of the solution to long-term prosperity, but as a threat to contemporary prosperity, those political parties were doing very well and had great domestic political purchase. So at a time of minority parliaments in Canada and isolationism internationally, we've managed to go from five to 43 free trade agreements around the world. So Canada, we are open for business. Our economy is growing, our taxes are low, our workforce is skilled, and our reach is global. We have signed and are moving forward with the implementation of the Canada-Europe Free Trade Agreement. A 35 million person country in Canada now has 500 million new customers for Canadian goods and services. We've signed and are moving forward with the Canada-South Korea Free Trade Agreement. South Korea, a country about the size of the province of New Brunswick, but with a population of 50 million people, our first free trade agreement in the Asia Pacific. And as I said, we're moving forward with our relationship here with the United States, expanding our capacity to have an even deeper and more effective trade relationship with the United States. The benefits for us as Canadians through low taxes and expanded free trade has been strong. We've recovered every job we've lost in the recession, but better than that, we have 1.1 million net new jobs that have been created in Canada since the dearth of the recession. Over 80% of those jobs have been full-time, 80% in the private sector, 63% of them in high-wage industries. And we've managed to achieve this record, as I said, against incredible forces pushing us in a different direction. But about our picture, it was Hillary Clinton who commented about Canada's economic situation when she said the following. She said, quote, Canadian middle class incomes are now higher than in the United States. Canadians are working fewer hours for more pay. They're living longer on average, and they're facing less income inequality. And Hillary Clinton was right. So the question for us as policymakers, those of us in the public sphere, those of you in the private sphere, is to, is to be thrust into the question of what's next. Well, for Canada, what's next is we are going to arrive at a balanced budget ahead of any other country by a wide margin in the spring of next year. And we have choices in front of us. We've lowered taxes to their lowest point in 50 years. We're expanding our free trade opportunities around the world. We're deepening our trade ties and relationship and opportunities here in the United States. And so what's next? Well, I submit to you, and I don't think there's a better place for me to argue this than here at Google, but I suggest to you that this is what's next for Canada. For Canada is to move forward with a digital policy that will benefit the Canadian economy. You know, we consulted Canadians widely before we came up with our digital policy, and there's a reason why we call it Digital Canada 150. Because in 2017, we will celebrate what is called, of course, the sesquicentennial, a word that people are going to have to get very accustomed to in both <laughs> French and English in the, in the years and months and years ahead. But we developed our digital policy after a great deal of consideration. 
and we arrived at a digital policy that makes sense for Canada. As we look around the world and other countries that have established and put in place and stood up digital policies, there is actually no single model that makes sense for all countries. But I'm going to walk you through briefly what we've done in Canada, why it makes sense for us, and why it is that we think we're going to prosper from this digital policy. It has five pillars. The first is connecting Canadians together. The second is protecting Canadians. The third is taking advantage of all the economic opportunities of the digital age. The fourth pillar is digital government, ensuring that governments are acting in a way that we hope that the private sector will be moved to go as well. And the fifth and the most important pillar, in my judgment, as the former Minister of Canadian Heritage, is the issue of Canadian content, making sure that culturally we are benefiting for the purposes of national unity by the benefits of the digital age. But I'll just walk through these very quickly. The first pillar is connecting Canadians, making sure that all of Canada is bound together and taking full advantage of the digital realities of today and the future. We put in place in this year's budget, and we're moving forward, and we'll have announcements this fall in this regard, a policy to make sure that 98% of all Canadians have high-speed internet anywhere in Canada. Now, that is a bold statement for a Canadian to make, I can tell you. Because while Canada is the second largest country in the world in size, we're the 37th largest in terms of population. And you know, of course, how Canadians are along the southern border of Canada, close to the United States, much of our population, 80% of our population. So for those who live outside of large urban centers or affluent suburban uh, neighborhoods that have healthy internet connectivity, for those who live in the rural parts of Canada, there's a real challenge in ensuring that we stay connected as we move forward. So we have our Connecting Canadians pro program. See, I, I have to show you this slide. Two weeks ago, I was up in Pond Inlet. Up in, it's the third most northern town in all of Canada. It's a population of about 1,000 people. They have virtually no internet connectivity whatsoever. Prime Minister Stephen Harper, we announced our rural broadband policy to make sure that everybody in these small villages are benefiting from rural broadband. And of course, it's economic opportunities, social opportunities, educational opportunities, health opportunities that are missed out if you don't have basic internet connectivity. So we went to the very small library, the one and only that they have, with a very small computer lab that they have there, the one, only one that they have, with only a couple of computers. And right above the computer is this sign, which says, please, no more YouTube. Big, red, tall letters hit you right in the face. It makes the internet very slow, and also people should limit themselves for 30-minute use on any computer. Thank you for your cooperation. Now, here at Google, that is nothing but a declaration of war, I would think. <laughs> nothing short of an attack, either, I suspect. But that's where we are. So you imagine this town, the third most northerly town in all of North America, and they can't have access to YouTube. And if they do, the entire village slows down. So you imagine actually trying to have some kind of commerce or getting some kind of product to a global market. Or imagine, in really difficult weather circumstance, trying to show your kid a lecture on YouTube so they can be exposed to some idea that maybe n might not be present. Or, by the way, drawing in some music or some theater or some kind of performing arts in a digital platform to have your kids get inspired by the creative arts. All of that is missing because they don't have the basic internet connectivity. So we've put together our rural broadband policy to connect Canadians. But our Connecting Canadians policy goes beyond that. We have our rural broadband piece, as I said. We have our Build Canada Fund. It's the largest investment of in infrastructure in Canada's history. And included in that is the investment into digital technology, whether it's Wi-Fi hotspots or other technology to ensure that we stay connected well into the future. We're unbundling television packages. Those of you who know that the CRTC is right now examining through their Let's Talk TV panels. But we've committed and we will move forward as a government to ensure that consumers have choice in the marketplace when it comes to the television channels that they're offered. And we've capped domestic roaming fees on wireless services to ensure that we have more competition and more consumer-friendly policies in the wireless world. And we are also making sure that communities have a say in where cell towers are built. On protecting Canadians, this is a, a vital piece because as more of our businesses, more of our social lives, more of our political and economic lives, all of it is migrating online, we need to make sure that online, the online world is safe. First, we've put forward in, in Parliament the Bill S-4, the Digital Privacy Act, which is designed to protect consumers from any violation of their privacy online. There have been some high-profile cases from some very well-known and high-profile firms on both sides of the border of violation of privacy. 
This protects Canadian consumers from that kind of violation with a mandatory notice period and stiff penalties if consumers are not put first in digital transactions. We also have cyberbullying legislation. As many of you know, this has been a source of real tragedy. In, in my hometown, a young girl was bullied um, mercilessly and viciously by a bunch of cowards online and drove her to suicide. Uh, this is far too common a reality, and we need to make sure that we protect our kids online. We're also going to make sure that our networks are secure from asymmetric or symmetric attacks or focused cyber terrorism or espionage. We need to make sure that all of our networks are protected, not just government ones, but all those beyond that. And of course, we've put it as, in place as well in Canada anti-spam legislation to make sure that the internet is efficient and efficiently moving forward. Taking advantage of economic opportunities, you know, the private sector does this well. Far be it for the government to lead in this regard, but it's important that the government listen in this regard and put in place the policy infrastructure so that those who are doing so well in the digital world are aided and not hurt by government policy. So we have the Business Development Bank of Canada that has a, a set funds aside to support digital adoption by firms. We have new internships across the government of Canada in digital, in digital policy positions. We have an accelerator and incubator program that is moving forward to support digital creation of jobs. And a small thing, but it's very important, again, with the places like Pond Inlet and remote communities, we're also building basic computer infrastructure in towns. And I put up the example of the Computer for Schools program in Canada. We have all these surplus computers, new technology comes and goes so quickly, but what was brand new in 2010 for basic computing and basic learning in, in far-flung communities and challenged Aboriginal communities that are often very isolated, that technology from just a couple years ago is perfectly fine and perfectly usable. And so what we do is we take surplus computers all across the public, uh, public sector in Canada that is often sitting in warehouses and waiting to be disposed of, and we hire students to come in and fix these computers. And they get them stood up, and they make sure that they're safe, and they make sure they're fully operational. And then those computers are repurposed into schools and villages and towns and Aboriginal communities all across Canada so that they can have just those basic tools of digital infrastructure that I promise you, when you visit these towns, you realize that are so far from reach from them, but are so easy for us to provide as a government if we just make an even modest investment. On digital government, I mean, this is the part where government needs to walk its talk. So we've put forward a number of initiatives. First off, government operations. It drives me crazy as an early adopter of all technology, and yes, I have my eye on Thursday and Friday of this week. As an early adopter of technology, it drives me crazy, and I'm sure it does for average Canadian taxpayers as well, when you pull up your smartphone and you want to find out about an application or to get some basic information about passport or travel information, and virtually no website in all of the government of Canada is done in a way that makes sense on a phone. None of it is responsibly designed. None of it makes sense. And we have email addresses and dead ends and websites don't work and it's completely backwards. And it's designed, frankly, often by bureaucrats sitting at desktop terminals to read web pages that are best presented on desktop terminals. That's not where we're going. We now live in a world where we pay $1,000 for a smartphone and $300 for a laptop. All of our digital infrastructure has been built in an era when we spent $5,000 for a desktop and cell phones weren't invented. We actually need to recognize that and modernize our digital approach as a government to ensure that we are actually engaging Canadians where they are and when they are using the technologies of their choice. We've also created the Open Data Institute as a government to make sure that government data is being used beyond the typical purposes of the government. Yes, we collect data, we use it for public policy purposes, for engagement, for, for information. But the secondary and tertiary use of this information for academic pursuit, for commercial and non-commercial purposes, being used by non-governmental organizations for all kinds, of, all kinds of reasons, it needs to be spilled out. Taxpayers are paying for this information, and if it's not a matter of national security or national sovereignty, this information should be spilled out, shared with Canadians, so that it can be used to its maximum velocity and purpose. And we also have an open science initiative as well, an open science institute that we're driving for forward as a government because of the departments of agriculture and fisheries and, and natural resources, we collect remarkable data of incredible peer-reviewed scientific uh, data that should be shared with, the, with other institutions in the private sector, again, to maximize its benefit. And we're accelerating new products to get them to market. But the fifth and the final pillar. So once you've connected Canadians together, once you've made sure it's as secure as you can as a government, 
personally through cyberbullying, making sure that anti-spam legislation works, making sure that our networks are secure. So you've built the networks, you make sure that they're secure, you make sure you maximize the economic benefit of the internet and, and the digital world. Fourth, you digitize government to the most common sense extent possible. And the fifth and final pillar, to me as a Canadian, is the most important one, and that's Canadian content. Through the sweep of Canada's history, our 147th birthday was this summer. It has always been the challenge of every prime minister and every government in Canada's history to make sure that Canada stays united. That is the big challenge of the fact of Canada. In the early days, it was Protestant and Catholic and French and English and Aboriginal and non and East and West and Aboriginal and non, North and South. The divisions in Canada, geographic, cultural, linguistic, historic, have always been the big challenges of keeping Canada united and prosperous moving forward. So in everything that the government does, in economic and social policy and now digital policy, always has to keep that in mind to make sure that we stay united. So to breathe life into those first four pillars is that issue of national unity as we go towards Canada 150. So we're supporting things like new heritage minutes across the country, making sure that digital content in everything that we do, all of our national museums, the National Film Board, Telefilm, everything that's being done always has at its heart a digital component to make sure that what we're paying for and what we're supporting as Canadians is being disseminated to Canadians in a digital way. And here's, a, here's a, another small project, like the Computer for Schools program. It's called the Memory Project. We made a terrible mistake as Canadians by allowing the first World War generation to come and to pass without properly recognizing, cataloging, learning from, and honoring the stories of the first World War generation. Today, the average age of a World War II veteran is 91, and they're passing away in a steadily increasing rate, as you can imagine. So we came up with this idea in concert with some private sector organizations, the Historica Dominion Institute and others, Historica Canada now, where we would go to veterans of the Second World War and we would say, tell us your story, if you want, in the voice, if you want, audio or video, whatever you want, and we will learn from your story, either from training, battle, when you came home, horror, maybe you found the love of your life, whatever, whatever aspect of your public service in the Second World War you want to tell, tell us your story. We'll come to you, you don't come to us, with whatever equipment, audio, video that you're comfortable with, and we'll catalog your story, and we'll house it in the Canadian Museum of History and the Canadian War Museum in Ottawa. It'll be digitized, preserved and protected forever in your voice. It's the language that we choose to you and the expression and the storytelling of our lives. That's what's key. It's not just what happened, it's how it happened and how we choose to express how it happened. That is the seminal moment of learning. And it'll be there forever for generations of Canadians to learn from your self-sacrifice. And for a small investment, we've done that and we've preserved all those stories and now we've expanded it to the Korean War veterans as well. So for Digital Canada 150, we have those pillars, connecting Canadians, protecting us online, taking advantage of economic opportunities, making sure the government is as digital as possible, and in the end, making sure that Canadian content, Canadian stories are understood, shared, and spread across the country and the world because we as Canadians are extraordinarily proud of our 147 years of history because at the time of Confederation, nobody thought we would be here. Nobody thought we would be here. It was barely news in London, by the way, Barely news in London in 1867 when Canada was created. It was certainly not news in 1864 at the Quebec and Charlottetown conferences, which led to 67. But here we are, through all the challenges, world wars, depressions, recessions, all these divisions, all these cleavages that I described all across this country. And now we're on the doorstep of our 150th birthday moving forward, more united and prosperous than ever before. As Canadians, be very proud of where we've come from, as Americans who look north to Canada and see a friendly neighbor, recognize that, that our country is indeed standing tall and proud. And it's not by accident. It is by hard work. It is by thinking through public policy and establishing public policy in a way that will benefit us for generations to come. And so what's next for us, of course, is digital and obviously taking full advantage of that, but recognizing that Canadian prosperity also means a healthy, robust, sustained partnership with the United States so that both of our economies can prosper and create jobs well into the future so that we can have indeed the future that we all like to dream and think of. Thanks very much for your time.
water? Water. water. That's great. Nicely done. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you Minister. Water for the minister. <laughs> Index cards for all y'all. Thank you. That was terrific. Thank you very much. Let me just say for 147, you look great. <laughs> um, I also was really pleased, and I know Ambassador Giffen shares um, my pleasure that I think you made news here today um, with the slide of the next president of the United States. So I think the breaking news here is uh, James Moore's hashtag ready for Hillary. <laughs> so, um, no, I, I think, uh, no, I, I think the, the, the message from, No need to clarify, Minister. We'll as as the phrase says, let me barge pull from any, uh, myself away from any uh, in involvement in American domestic politics. But no, but, but we know um, uh, Senator Clinton, uh, Secretary Clinton, uh, was, uh, did a uh, widespread, widely publicized and um, well attended tour of Canada through Vancouver, Calgary, Montreal, I believe Toronto as well, on a speaking tour with her uh, most recent book. Um, and she made those comments, and, and you know, we as Canadians, we do pay attention um, to the opinion of Americans uh, and what they think of us, and whether we agree or disagree. But it does matter. And someone of her uh, her stature making an accurate assessment of where Canada's um, economic health is is something that we will be very proud to um, echo. Couldn't agree more. Uh, I should tell everybody that uh, I, I neglected to say this earlier. We are streaming live on YouTube, so um, everybody in Pond Inlet, you probably should turn off so that you're... <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, you know, but, yeah, the sovereignist movement in Quebec is not in good shape, but if we crash YouTube in all of Nunavut, I think we may have uh, some challenges politically there as well. So. <laughs> there you go. Um, so before we get into the, the, the discussion about the talk you just had, um, I would just love to know what else you're doing while you're in town, just to give us a sense. I had a very good conversation, as I said in the beginning, had a good conversation with former Governor Dean, uh, Ambassador Giffen, uh, Ron Kaufman as well, talking about uh, just getting an update on the political dynamic here. Um, I'll be meeting with um, Secretary of Commerce Pritzker um, uh, this afternoon, um, have some uh, meetings as well in Congress. Um, the situation in Ukraine is, has the attention of the Canadian Parliament today. Uh, we'll have the attention of a joint session of Congress tomorrow as well, and I, and I gather I'm, I may have the privilege of, 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 of uh, attending um, that presentation. Uh, it's a part of the world that is um, uh, deeply troubling uh, for Canada. Um, President Obama has remarked, I think, assertively on that as well. I think there are over 1.2 million Canadians of Ukrainian descent um, in a country of 35 million people. Um, so the, the, what's happening in, uh, in Crimea and in Ukraine is of great con uh, consequence geopolitically, and the Prime Minister of Canada has asserted himself in that regard. But domestically, it's very close to the heart for a lot of Canadians. Absolutely. Um, okay. We're going to go to some cards. All right. Let's hope that I can read them. Uh, congratulations on the Burger King Tim Hortons deal, um, <laughs> the, or the possibility, this says. To, um, what's, your, what's your thought about how the approval process will go? I, I mean, we've talked at the Canadian American Business Council about the fact that the corporate tax rate you referenced in your speech um, here is 35%. In Canada, I think you lowered it to 15 um, and so there's a very politically controversial uh, phenomenon happening here. At Ireland, it's 12, I think, where U.S. firms can legally locate somewhere else um, and avoid that tax burden. Um, so good job on attracting the investment. But what does the process look like? And, and give, us, give us a little sense of the future. Uh, the process will take some time. It was actually um, it was announced, I, I, um, what, four weeks ago now, if memory serves? Uh, the actual submission is my department, Department of Industry, that does the assessment through the Investment Canada Act of the transaction. Uh, we received the actual paperwork uh, yesterday, or uh, last week, late last week. Um, so, um, so we're in the process of examining that. Um, it'll take um, a few weeks. It doesn't take a long time um, for a number of reasons. Um, but look, I, and so I'm not going to prejudge that particular investment. But I will say the fact that Burger King as I said, Microsoft, others are looking to head to Canada, looking north, see Canada as a, as a place of opportunity, not just because of Canada's domestic market and not just for tax purposes, but also because as a launching pad for global economic commerce through our now 43 free trade uh, agreements, um, we're very much, um, we think, a, a leader in that regard. So, you know, Burger King coming to Canada, you're welcome to come to Canada. Please come to Canada, other firms as well. Um, set up shop, hire Canadians, uh, continue to do business, uh, expand your footprint around the world. 
um, Canada is, uh, is open for business. Great, thank you. Well, let's stick with this theme for a second. A related question, I had the opportunity to have a, a conversation with your colleague, the Right Honorable Stephen Harper, a couple years ago, and it was right before the uh, Chinese National Oil Corporation was um, looking to buy Next in a Canadian oil and gas company. Um, so different situation, because uh, it's a state-owned enterprise. The question here is Canada has developed more tools than the U.S. for reviewing FDI, foreign direct investment, by state-owned enterprises. So could you comment on your thinking about SOEs, and do you think that the U.S. needs to, suge needs to strengthen our own, uh, what we call a CFIUS review, which is um, how we look at foreign investment? I'll leave the second part aside, because again, I, I don't want to comment on, on U.S. domestic, but I'll speak to our example, and then from it, from it the American um, policymakers can can decide whether or not it's a path to follow. Um, the Prime Minister was in December of 2013 when the, when the decision was made on the Nexon transaction. It was ultimately approved, but we do have a policy where state-owned enterprises can invest in Canada with regard to, to the oil, oil sector. Um, and you know, it is a strategic asset. It's important for Canada. Um, and uh, state-owned enterprises can invest is up to 49%. Uh, no other country in the world, by the way, would relent and, and um, uh, back away entirely and completely have a laissez-faire ad attitude uh, of an asset in, in that regard. So we've been very clear about what the policy is. Uh, the Prime Minister himself enunciated it. It has been very um, well understood uh, in China uh, and elsewhere. But we still welcome and we still have had expanded um, investment uh, by state-owned firms as well. Um, Progress Energy, uh, Petronas, uh, is investing in LNG in my home province of British Columbia. The largest single um, SOE investment uh, into in Canadian history is in, is in my home province. I'm, I, I, as Minister, um, was you know tasked with such as it is, uh, tasked with uh, approving that investment, and we welcome that investment because you know we're as I said the second largest country in size, 37th largest in population. We need investment, and we attract it by having clear rules through the Investment Canada Act, clear rules for state-owned enterprises, and having a low tax regime that makes the investment and the profit that you derive therefrom uh, an attractive option compared to um, other uh, jurisdictions. Thanks. Uh, you talk a lot about the and rightly so, I would say, as a free trader, about the free trade agreements that the government's negotiating and in the process of negotiating. Um, from the United States' point of view, one of the big issues is intellectual property protection um, when we look at free trade deals. Uh, so this question relates to that, and it reads, for manufacturers of all sizes, intellectual property protection and enforcement in Canada and elsewhere is more important than ever before. We've seen some worrying signs from Canada on this front, whether on patent utility and data protection for medicines, I think that's referring to the courts, the, the, uh, what the courts are doing, um, to cooperation to combat trade in pirated and counterfeited goods. What is the government of Canada doing or planning to do to address these concerns and strengthen Canada's innovation environment? Um, I'll say three things. Uh, one, on innovation, we have a very aggressive and robust uh, policy as a government of Canada when it comes to, to investing in innovation and supporting that sector. It's been well received and well regarded. We partnered with the private sector, with university institutions in order to maximize uh, what's being invented, what's making marketplace and, and uh, rapid but responsible approvals of, of products to get them to the market. Um, second, on, uh, on the issue of counterfeit goods, we have legislation before the Parliament of Canada uh, and I have to say that this was legislation that was arrived at after a great deal of consultation. After uh, we had a very good relationship with Ambassador Jacobson when he was in uh, when he was in Ottawa on the subject of intellectual property, when we tabled our Copyright Modernization Act, and there was some there was some give and take with with the um, with the American government about what they expected and and uh, expected Canada to have in terms of an IP regime and what they hoped as Americans would be in that legislation. But we took a Canada-specific lens. Uh, that we think is in the best interest of Canada, that in the end, I think, um, accomplished a lot of things that um, the American government were hoping for, which is clarity and certainty about IP law in Canada and having a five-year review of the legislation perpetually going, going forward. And that's, by the way, an important thing I would say more broadly about intellectual property. As I said in the beginning of my talk, Canada elected three minority parliaments in a row. Canada's copyright legislation hadn't been updated substantively in almost 20 years. And one of the reasons why has been because of domestic politics in Canada. Um, it, it's a very tough, because intellectual property law, as you know, is very often a zero-sum game. It's often seen that way uh, by very aggressive and vocal communities. Uh, it's a country that linguistically and culturally, um, particularly with the province of Quebec, managing that relationship responsibly in terms of public policy is forever a challenge. And But a challenge in a good way, because it, it's, it, it means you can't just sort of 
blindly stumble forward. You have to be nuanced about it. And so therefore, our IP laws have lagged for a long time. And the American government correctly and others chastised the government of Canada of different stripes to actually get this done. Well, we did get it done. We have the Copyright Modernization Act in place. And we have a mandated five-year review of the legislation forever so that we cannot be a laggard. I don't care what any particular politician, mine or others, I don't care what your political dynamic looks like and whether or not you have the courage to tackle the issue. You are going to tackle the issue by force of law and review this legislation because we cannot allow Canada to stagnate. Burger King and Microsoft and others are not going to invest in Canada and other firms if they don't have a clear set of rules on what their IP protection is. IP is everything in the digital age. It is every, it is, you can build all the high-speed internet in the world. You can build all of this infrastructure. You can have not three but four. You can have 10 wireless carriers offering open access to everything. It doesn't matter at all if we are not giving people protection of what it is that they're creating with their mind and their tools. And uh, so it's, it's essential that we get that right. And I think I covered the three things. I think you did. Um, for those of you that are tweeting, the hashtag is CABC Dialogues, and also uh, the minister is active on Twitter and has a handle at James Moore something. Underscore org. Underscore org. Um, let's, let's go back to the discussion on digital. Um, you you outlined connecting all Canadians, and, and that's um, really important, obviously. It's important for everybody in the world. It's important for a giant, vast space like Canada. One of, and, and I would argue that, um, that that might be the easy part. I want to ask you about the hard part, and we have a couple of cards on this. And that is, as a policymaker, how do you balance um, people's desire for privacy, for um, to be anonymous, with the public need to be able to um, uh, use information for law enforcement. In, in Europe, there's a big debate about what they're calling the right to be forgotten. I just wonder, um, in Canada, how are you sorting through these issues between innovation on the one hand um, and advancements uh, in technology and privacy autonomy, um, excuse me, anonymity uh, on the other? First, the... Um, uh, the preamble to your question, it's actually not easy. It, it trips off the tongue to say, well, we're just going to wire the country. And I, I, know, I know you didn't mean it quite that way. But as I said, the vastness and size of Canada, I mean, there, there are parts of Canada where it, it's only satellite that's, that's offered. Uh, and the, the technology that's offered to get high-speed internet is um, very expensive in the, in the final product for, for the average consumer. So to actually map Canada and build the infrastructure grid for uh, high-speed internet is quite a challenge. We're partnering with the private sector. We have the country um, cut up into pieces of service areas, and we're going to be doing uh, RFPs, uh, request proposals, uh, very soon and engaging the private sector. So it's a, I can promise you, in a country that are our size, uh, it, it is arduous, and partnering with provincial investments in that regard. I didn't mean it was easy. I just meant yeah. compared to the next part. I think it's Fair enough. I probably yeah. present it as being too easy, but it is challenging. The next part, you're quite right. I think part of the answer to the, all those questions feeds into the intellectual property law part, because the Digital Privacy Act that we have um, is our IP law framework, but we know that it's going to grow and shrink as a consequence of court decisions domestically, court decisions uh, in the United States and elsewhere, um, changing uh, uh, social expectations of what technology could or shouldn't do, different business adaptations of what technology means for the marketplace, and that's going to be forced into that conversation as well. The, the privacy stuff, um, the Digital Privacy Act, S4, that's before Parliament right now, it's actually kind of perfect timing uh, because the right to be forgotten debate in uh, the European case uh, will have, I think, um, a lot of people in Canada, certainly in the United States, paying close attention to what that means. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are, as I said, the high-profile cases, not to name names, but, uh, but, uh, but Target in Canada. Uh, they had uh, a data breach that was heavily consequential. But I think this is only the beginning of this whole area of law. If you're a young Canadian or a young American and you're going into law school, this is a very prosperous universe of investment of your time and degree going forward because the, the, this is, it, there's a whole new universe of uh, jurisprudence that has even yet to be um, begun to be thought of. Uh, and so we, we think in Canada we have a policy framework that allows for the intake and the forced discussion regardless of a politician's ad, ad, uh, um, appetite for the conversation, forced conversation in order to address these issues. Just want to make sure I understand. I'm blonde, so it takes me a minute. I think you're not really saying definitively that there is a right to be forgotten or there is not a right. I think what you're saying is complicated area, got to see what's happening with the courts, 
lots of law students from now on uh, going to be studying it. Have I gotten that right? Yeah, I'm not going to assert what our law is. I mean, our law is in the Digital Privacy Act. But the right to be forgotten is, I mean, it's you know, es establishing rights. We're not going to draw in something from a European court, and so they, therefore that is now a right in Canada. But I think that if a Canadian member of parliament put forward a private member's bill, tried to assert it in Canadian law, I think there are a lot of people, including myself, that would be very attracted to um, the establishment of that kind of a law in Canada. It would be challenging to see how it would be implemented and how it be in, would be enforced, um, because that's, it's actually very complicated. It's easy to assert the follow-through is a hassle. Um, so I'd be interested right. to see how that unfolds. Yeah, absolutely. Um, staying on, on the digital world for a minute and, and technology, um, I, I really appreciated your comments about um, Digital Canada 150 strategy in leveraging information um, to help the economy and how it, you know, it should, so many things in our economy should be easier than they are in terms of the paperwork and whatever. Um, at the Canadian American Business Council, we gave a proposal to the White House and the Privy Council PMO um, a couple weeks ago at a, at a round table on the Beyond the Border initiative where we said, look, um, crossing the border uh, with goods. Crossing the border is, as, as business travelers has gotten relatively better. I don't know how many people in here have a Nexus card. Kelly Johnson saying yes. It's, it's great. You don't really talk to a, a grumpy uh, or a happy cop at the border. Uh, you just you scan your irises, you go right through and uh, you, you know they, they've determined that Kelly Johnson's actually a trusted traveler, low risk. He can go through without being, uh, without being um, you know, questioned further. That kind of progress in the last three years since the Beyond the Border Initiative, which you mentioned in your talk, um, we haven't seen that kind of progress yet mm. with shipment of goods. So um, whether it's equipment going back and forth across the border or um, commodities or whatever, uh, business leaders tell us that they spend extra weeks in just in paperwork um, and they spend extra days sitting at the border while a cop reviews the paperwork. And so, sorry for the long preamble, That's but fine. the question is, you know, you're a high-tech guy. Your government is doing this stuff. What about the possibility of convening a hackathon or an appathon, if you like that better, using the power of the two governments to convene companies like the one where we're sitting in and others to go, okay, just solve the information sharing problem. Make it as easy as a couple of clicks, both to submit your paperwork and also for the law enforcement to be able to review it so they can do their job, which is look at the really important job, which is to look at the high-risk stuff. How do you react to that? I would welcome it. I actually, I don't see a problem with it. I mean, ha hackathons to, to create, you know, solutions for challenges. So this time next week, y'all. <laughs> exactly. We did have a hackathon in Canada um, last year. Uh, Tony Clement, who's the Treasury Board uh, uh, Minister, a uh, former Industry Minister as well, um, he led a hackathon. It was, it was, it was a phenomenal success. Uh, that we're so much so that we're doing another one uh, again. But there, there, I don't see any, there, there's any reason why we wouldn't um, have an opportunity to collaborate like that in public policy. I mean, we, people collaborate like that for all kinds of solutions. I mean, I know when Angry Bird was taken off of iTunes, people, there were all kinds of hackathons for people to stand up a new Angry Bird so that we can... Not, so, I mean, if the private sector can actually mobilize thousands of people to come together and collaborate in order to revive a, a, a stupid little video game that everybody is addicted to, then I suspect we can probably get people to come together and collaborate on some of our more challenging policy questions. Absolutely. And the benefits to the economy, if you can solve border wait times, would be instantaneous. Um, yeah. So totally worth doing. Yeah. Um, you know, I just want to share with everybody here that uh, when we were chatting before we walked in, I asked the minister, is there anything, I said, I'm going to be given a stack of index cards. Is there anything that's a holy grail or anything that you don't you know, that you want me to edit out. And he just said, bring it on. Um, so uh -oh. I'm impressed by that. <laughs> so, yeah, and, push and, me back and then you pull me right back in. <laughs> and I would also note that you must be very important because Alex Panetta with the CP is wearing a tie today. Oh, wow. Um, in the Google office, so we're making history. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to read this card. Um, and I don't know a lot about the issue. Will Statistics Canada data be made available free as part of the open data initiative, at least for academics and students? That's a good question and a good, actually a very good suggestion. Um, Wayne Smith, who's the head of um, Statistics Canada, I'd be more than glad to, to pass that on. The Open Data Institute is actually just Here being. You can a, give it to him. Okay, very good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the 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 Open Data the Open Data Institute is is uh, is just being created. It's a three million dollar investment, which again, and it, to scale, it sounds so so modest, but for Canada, it matters. Uh, and and the benefit of this relatively simple initiative, the secondary and tertiary, all those institutions that will benefit, will be pretty widespread. Um, I'm more than glad to pass on um, the recommendation. Um, 
as long as it's not anything that's, uh, as I say, um, a question of national sovereignty or national security, um, you know, the, the stuff that they have at um, that Stats Canada should be shared with as many Canadians as possible. They've generally done, a, I, I think, a, an admirable job. Um, they have a pretty steady drumbeat uh, of tap, tap, tap on Twitter of pumping out the stuff that they do do. Um, and I think they're only going to gather more public confidence if they engage in kind of those kinds of partnerships. But I'd be more than happy to pass on the suggestion. Okay, let's keep it, keep it rolling. Uh, again, another question, not my words, but I'll just read it. The Canada-U.S. price gap on consumer goods yeah. makes little sense given that 80 percent of Canada's population exists within 100 miles of the border. Uh, when will Canada work on this? Um, the, uh, the this is an Did issue. Did your chief of staff give me this question? Is that I think so. <laughs> <laughs> no. Did I didn't think that was a softball, you yeah. know? But anyway. it, it's it's a throne <laughs> it's a throne speech commitment that we've made. Um, the Canada U.S. price gaps issue is is a um, it, it, again it's one of those things where as a slogan it comes off the tongue uh, very easily. But in Canada, the, we had a, a Senate committee did a pretty exhaustive study on the issue of Canada U.S. price gaps. And it was determined there, and it has been determined elsewhere, that from time to time, it's not necessarily systemic, but from time to time that there are firms that take advantage and go beyond the, the spirit and intent and perhaps the fact of the North American Free Trade Agreement uh, and engage in very aggressive pricing um, that is counterintuitive to what a marketplace would expect there to be a, a price for. Um, so we're looking at options and we'll be coming forward with, with I think, a very modest proposal, but that I think will have far-reaching um, benefit to addressing the concern that has been raised by consumer groups across Canada uh, and uh, that has been raised with some very high-profile cases in the media in Canada about price gaps that is, exist between Canada and the United States that are not a consequence of whether cost of getting products to market, uh, price differentiation, um, dollar valuation, so on, and that are, that we think could very well be discriminatory. So an opportunity for that to be exposed and investigated is what we're considering. For the fall? Soon. Soon, okay. Um, I, I would just add an editorial comment here that the several members in this room of the Canadian American Business Council have been working for years on regulatory cooperation mm. uh, between Canada and the United States. And there are little tiny regulatory differences that don't mean anything. And um, and I know there will be a big get together at the Canadian Embassy with all of the regulators and 30 working groups to work through uh, how you resolve some of those regulatory differences. Because I would submit that that adds um, some costs as well. It's not it, it doesn't explain everything, but um, it, it, you know it, it, it's crazy that at, at, at the Campbell Soup facility in uh, in Ontario, the kind of different hurdles they have to jump through for essentially the same market and. Yeah. Kelly can tell us chapter and verse on that. And, and frankly, I, I, and I recognize that it cuts both ways. And we are dealing with national, subnational levels of government, and, and it's it is a complicated question. That's why when someone when one asks, "What are you going to do about the Canada-U.S. price gap?" It's like it's it, it, it's, it's far tough. far more nuanced than that. Yeah. The the ambition that we have and the and the outcome of the policy that we will announce will not in any way create new layers or new. Uh, obstructions to a more uh, free access to goods going north and south between Canada and the United States. That is not the goal and it will not be the consequence of anything that we're looking at. What we're looking at more is is having an opportunity to expose whether or not um, um, anti-competitive behavior is being engaged in. Okay. Um, let's stick with that for a second. A related question um, when we're talking about buying things in one country or the other. Uh, Here's, here's the question. If a Canadian flies back in, into Canada from the United States, they can bring back $800 of goods with no duties or taxes. If they mail it back to Canada, the limit is $25. What up with that? <laughs> uh, I don't know what up with that. Okay. Um, I... I uh, I, don't, I, I gather it's, it's like easier to mail things back and forth, whereas I think if you... I think it's a question of reciprocity, right? If you're in Vancouver and you're going to go across the border, you're going to go to Bellingham and Bellis Fair, you may purchase $500 worth of whatever and come back. But in the exchange of coming back, you're probably going to buy lunch down there and you're probably going to buy some gas down there and buy some other things that will benefit the local economy. So I suspect it's a question of reciprocity versus just um, allowing Canada Post or uh, Pure Later to just open up the floodgates and have uh, goods flow north without any duties being paid at all. I, I, I suspect that's why. It's a question of reciprocity. Why 825? I, 
I don't know. Gary Dewar, I'm sure, knows. <laughs> I think our friends from Federal Express yes. and EPS might have a view on that <laughs> yes, as well. Exactly. We, can, yeah. we, we can follow up on that. Yeah. Um, uh, I want to give a last call for any cards, because we are going to wrap up in the next couple of minutes. Um, and while you're thinking about that, uh, I'm just trying to see if, we've, if, if I've gone through it. I think I've gone through everybody's cards. Okay. Right, so let me just do, while you're thinking of your last questions, if there are any, let me just give a small ad for the Canadian American Business Council. Please. We love these dialogues. We love everybody participating in them. September 30th in Ottawa, if you're there, we're bringing a major cabinet uh, secretary from the United States to Ottawa. And uh, we're not, I'm not uh, announcing that trip, but we'll be doing so soon. And so um, anybody who's from Ottawa or tuning in on YouTube or you yourself, Minister, um, we'd love to have you up there. And the discussion will be on cross-border goods. Um, the other thing that I would just announce to everybody is that on November 6th, uh, you, you talked about the memory project in Canada, and um, and and I think the um, the history that our two countries have, um, particularly with with the gr the Great Wars and the Greatest Generation, is a remarkable part of who we are. And and I am thrilled that you're doing that. We're bringing Tom Brokaw, who has uh, worked a lot on the generational project, uh, to Ottawa on November sixth. So he's going. We're going to have a state of the relationship uh, conversation with him. And um, again, I'd like to invite everybody here, everybody tuning in, and, and I hope that you'll come and be our guest for both September 30th and November 6th. Wow. Um, and with that, Should we wrap? Is, there, is there another question? All right, well, I just want to <laughs> present you with a, a little thank you gift. And this is something, uh, the ninth, I think it was the ninth Prime Minister of Canada, Arthur Meehan, said of Canada and the United States, uh, we're not in the same boat, but we're pretty much in the same waters. And so this summer, anybody that was at, the, at Gary Dewar's place at the Canadian Embassy on the 4th of July at our party received one of these. And you weren't there, so we saved you one. Oh, very this good. is a boat tote for your young family in Vancouver. <laughs> very it's good. It's got Canada and US flags. Nice. Uh, and uh, the only thing we ask in return, since you're so active on social platforms, is sometimes when you're out and about, tweet a picture and tell us where you are with it and how you are. Very, very good. Well, thank you very so much. Join me in thank thank you. the Minister. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're good. Appreciate it.